Welcome to Money Making Conversations. I am your host, Rashawn McDonald. I say this every week. It's time to stop reading other people's success stories and start writing your own. People talk about gifts. They talk about passions. If you have a gift, lead with your gifts. And don't let your age, friends, family, or coworkers stop you from planning or living your dreams. My interviews on Money Making Conversations include celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and people I like to call industry decision makers. My next guest is Melissa Haslip. She is an award-winning filmmaker. Melissa has, no, when I say that, from a producer, director, writer of the award-winning docu-series that I just recently saw, Mr. Soul. The film Mr. Soul is now available on HBO Max, one of my favorite channels. Melissa Haslip spotlights the groundbreaking variety show Soul with an exclamation mark. It's very important that brought out because that was one of the keys to the show being on television. And the enigmatic, enigmatic producer and host, Ellis Haslip. The late Ellis Haslip is Melissa's uncle. Ellis was a DC native and graduated from the Howard University. Now, before Oprah, before Arsenio, there was Mr. Soul, Ellis, America's first Black Tonight Show. The series is among the first to provide expanded images of African Americans on television with the participants and recollections and illuminating archival clips. Mr. Soul captures a critical moment in our culture where impact continues to resonate and an unsung hero. That's him, whose voice we needed then, and guess what? We need it today. That's the importance of this documentary. Please welcome to Money Making Conversation as we discuss how dreams are built. Miss, she's the, she's the writer, she's the director, Melissa Haslip. How you doing there, my friend? Hey, great to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk about Mr. Soul. With the exclamation yeah. mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> Gotta have an exclamation point. <laughs> you know, it's really important that, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for coming on Money Making Conversation, Melissa. Um, when I see a show like this, and, oh, you know, I just want to say it's like, you know, I, I've lived a good life and I hope to live a, continue to live a good life. When I see shows like this, and they, I, I kind of missed it. You know, I didn't see it when it was on, and even though I, I was... I, I should have seen it. It was on PBS. It was on regular TV. We didn't have cable back then. It was on the Channel 8 in Houston, Texas. That was my channel. That was my PBS channel. So I should have saw seen this show, but I was so busy trying to see blacks on other network shows, on The Tonight Show, you know, Ed Sullivan, uh, you know, Julia, you know, all these shows that that when we saw it, we ran to the television set and told all our black friends, oh, a black person on TV. And it's really, is true. That really did happen like that. And uh, and so we were inspired there. And that's why black music was so important because we could see and feel our stars. And when they came to town, we showed up. Now, when you came about this, you know, he's a relative of yours. To walk us through the steps of this being brought to your attention. How was it brought to your attention, Mr. Soul, and this early steps of getting it to where we have it now on HBO Max? Yes, well, it's been a long journey. Mm -hmm. um, started making the film over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that's definitely a labor of love, right. but also a labor of love for the culture. It's a love letter to Black culture, mm -hmm. to Black arts, mm -hmm. you know, to Black lives, mm -hmm. everything that really matters today. Right. And what we wanted to do was to tell the story of, you know, this is sort of a cultural moment visually that happened before Soul Train. Yes. And everyone kind of thinks that our visual history, you know, on television and in the media started with Soul Train. And it's important to recognize that Soul was a television show, as you mentioned, that was on PBS nationwide from 1968 to 1973. Mm -hmm. And that those were really critical moments in which we were trying to reimagine ourselves on this cultural landscape and this American landscape and on the heels of the civil rights movement, Jim Crow segregation so much. And so the idea that you could have a full black experience on TV in your living room, right. you know, <laughs> at a moment when they weren't really feeling us because, you know, segregation and Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. It was a very, very volatile time. Um, race relations were not great, as we know, uh, in 1968. Mm -hmm. So here you have this extraordinary show that really reaffirms Black beauty, Black strength, Black love, Black sister and brotherhood. Yes. Then amazing soul music with artists you've never seen before on television for the first time. We well, yeah, yeah. Earth, Wind and Fire for the first time. Absolutely. Al Green for the first time. Patti Absolutely. LaBelle and the Bluebells. You know, it's crazy. Well, you know, so the beauty have... of this show is that when I, when I look at it, and thank you, Melissa, for just setting the tone of what we're going to be talking about. It was set in New York, correct? 
Yes, it was on PBS out of the flagship PBS station in New York, which is WNET, mm-hmm. Channel 13. Mm-hmm. But it was at the, the beginning of public broadcasting. So it was creating a national black audience when when there really wasn't PBS just at that moment until the National Broadcasting Act created PBS. And suddenly you had stations connecting all around the country and everybody was getting to see, you know, black people on TV. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you only had uh, ABC, CBS, NBC Mm -hmm. and PBS. So those were the only options on television. And just it was monochromatic. There were no black people on television, pretty much. So that's why this show means so much to look back and understand what was soul about and how did it interrupt television as we know it and change the perception Mm -hmm. of African-American culture. And black, making black beautiful. Well, you know, I'm talking to Melissa here, and she's the writer and director of the, it's appearing on HBO Max. It's called Mr. Souls. Hers is a docu-series. Like I said, the series is on television, PBS, uh, 1968 to 1973, and it involves a, a host by the name of Ellis. He was, a, he was not a guy who wanted to be a comedian, wanted to be a singer. He was another guy. He was a guy who was a producer. And, uh, and, and, and I would let you watch the docu-series and see how he became the actual host of the show. Show. But he became a host from a standpoint of he followed his creative vision. In other words, when she talks about this show, the typical artists who appeared on the typical ABC, NBC, and CBS were performers. They were singers. They were comedians. They were actors. They were not traditional to the you know. So the but on his show. Mr. So, he had dancers, he had poets, he had individuals, he had interviews with, that would never, ever be on mainstream television, period. Wouldn't even be touched period. by the news, by the news. <laughs> and so it's important that we set that stage because of the fact of, why am I, why am I interviewing? Why is the importance of Mr. So? You have a show that was kind of, it was funded by the government. Because of PBS, no, that's how shows get on PBS. They have to get funding by the government. And because otherwise, it would not have been funded or produced or picked up on traditional ABC, NBC, uh, CBS affiliates. And those were the dominant channels at the time. I'm just going to just take some young people back to that era. And when television went off back then, it went off. I mean, once the flag started, it just goes, and you had a dial tone that came on your screen, and that was it. Okay, once you saw the flag, you were done with watching television that night. That's the era we're talking about. Not the era of your phone, not the streaming and digital and all these different channels on cable and direct TV. When television went off in 1968, it went off. And you had to go to bed or, or, or you looked around and your parents looked at you and wondered why you were still up because the flag has said, go to bed. Am I not right, <laughs> Melissa? <laughs> you ain't never lying, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and so you had this wonderful show called Mr. Soul come on television and uh, give us a little background on that, the purpose, yeah. and then the fact that he is a relative of yours. Yes, and he's an LSA. HBCU graduate as well, and, uh, yes. and of Howard University in Washington, D.C. Talk a little bit about him, because he was a courageous person. He mm-hmm. was a creative person, but he didn't seek the limelight. That's right. Ellis Hazlip was my uncle, and he really believed in the elevation of Black culture. He believed that liberation came from freedom of expression being able to express them to ourselves and be our true black selves, you know, not somebody else's definition of who we are. And that was really radical because black power, the black Panthers, that was just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. And here comes this producer who nobody knows Mm -hmm. and he's totally in the background, but he believes if you can just make black culture visible, black artists and black politicians, you know, controversial figures like the Black Panthers, Mm -hmm. but also artists that you would only hear on the radio or see. If you were lucky, you might see them on the Chitlin circuit. You might see them at the Apollo, Mm -hmm. but otherwise you only got to hear them on the radio. So imagine getting to see people for the first time and see groups like Cool and the Gang, Mm -hmm. Earth, Wind and Fire, Mm -hmm. Al Green, Mm -hmm. you know, jazz artists like Max Roach, 
Mm -hmm. uh, McCoy Tyner. Right. Uh, you know, people that you you might know a little bit about, but we're literally getting their television debut because I have to remember this was before Soul Train and there wasn't a model for this. Right. So here comes Ellis Hazlip, who is kind of a fish out of water. He's never been on television before, but he's a theatrical producer and he believes in black culture. He believes in black dance, black poets. He puts Nikki Giovanni in an interview with James Baldwin. Yes. And many people have seen that because it went viral on television. I mean, sorry, it went viral on social media. Mm -hmm. But nobody knows that that came from Soul. So the series itself was called Soul. And then Ellis Hazel became known as Mr. Soul because his last name, Hazel, was hard to pronounce. And they would see him walking in Harlem and they go, there goes, um, there he goes, the Soul... Yeah, Mr. Soul. That's Mr. Soul. That's Mr. Soul. That's who that is. <laughs> well, you know, so the, 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 actually known as Mr. Soul. So well, that's why we've been. He deserved that title. He deserved that title. And the thing about it, the primary purpose of Soul was to educate entertain mm -hmm. and allow people to share in the black experience. That's why it was on PBS. That's how it was sold as an educational platform. And it made right. blacks visible in a society where blacks had been invisible. When I say that, like she said, it, you know, we, we, it was a pretty dark period uh, for black um, civil rights. You know, uh, John F. Kennedy had been shot in the 60s. You know, uh, right. Robert Kennedy had been shot in the 60s. And of course, unfortunately, also Dr. Martin Luther King had been shot in the 60s. Yeah, so and they were ever blacks too. Were, blacks were lost. They had no voice. Yeah. And then this yeah. show called Soul, and that's a soul with an exclamation mark, came on television. Um, and, and, and it allowed, like you said, this image that was betrayed. Also, we had Vietnam War playing mm -hmm. out in the background. And we had this uh, uh, Richard Nixon presidency plan out in the background there's a lot of mm -hmm. behind the scene activity that goes on and we hear the word cancel culture you see how cancel culture plays itself out in this docuseries yeah. of all the things that you were doing and evaluate like say 10 years to do this what surprised you the most and what maybe say disappointed you the most that the series wasn't appreciated enough and how it ended if you can talk about that I think what surprised me the most in interviewing people who were either on the show or people who were behind the scenes, like Stan Lathan, an amazing director. Stan Lathan got his start on Soul. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know that. Mm -hmm. He became famous when he moved to L.A. and started directing Sanford and Son and all this, everything that's happened since then. Now he's directing Dave Chappelle series, mm -hmm. you know, but Stan Lathan cut his teeth learning how to direct on Soul. And Ellis Hayes have always provided these opportunities for people who wouldn't have them. You know, you didn't have black directors back then on national television and you didn't have black associate producers or women. So Ellis changed all of that. He said, you want to be an actress? Come work with me as an associate producer and I'll help you become an actress. That's Anna Maria Horsford from right. Amen. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's just amazing that he was always pushing the culture and pushing opportunities for people. And what, what surprised me 50 years later is that it's still right here. It's still very, very emotional for people that, that it, like it just happened. Like this was a moment in their career that they will never forget. And so that energy, because I was worried, you know, it was 50 years ago mm -hmm. and I was hoping, mm -hmm. I was worried, how am I going to convey that kind of vibe? Like it's happening today. So it doesn't feel like we're just looking back and being nostalgic. Mm -hmm. And what surprised me was like all those emotions were right on the surface mm -hmm. and that everybody was so invested in the show and that when it was canceled, you know, it left a hole, it left a void because there was no way to feel our true power in a way that was unfiltered and unapologetically black. You know, other shows started to come on, right. like, um, uh, you know, different types of talk shows mm -hmm. and black power shows. Gil Noble had a show like Like It Is. Of we, course, Tony Brown. It wasn't, it wasn't this show. It, it wasn't this show. And I think that's right. important that we say that because the fact that host wasn't wasn't born out of entertainment. He was born out of creativity. He's born out of production. And like you said, this project has been, and then the hairstyles, oh my goodness. That, oh, you know, like I said, uh, 
you know, it, it, those things, that, they had to be perfect. You had the, the perfect hairstylist. But you touched on some of your conversation about the presence of women as producers in the background of development, which we see now African-American women having such a prominent role as producers, as yourself, being a producer, writer, and creative minds. That's something we need to bring out in this interview because you are female. And like I said, we mentioned Anna and Anna. Anna, 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 Anna yeah. You know, who uh, started, who built her. And I was kind of surprised. I went, oh, that's Anna. And I went, because I didn't know that about her. I didn't know she had, was a writer. I didn't know she was a producer. All I knew about her was as an actress. And so mm-hmm. talk about seeing the layer of producers from a female perspective being the, the, the heartbeat of this show, Soul. Well, there was another producer who became the first uh, the first woman and the first black woman associate producer on a show. And her name was Alice Hill Jackson. She's featured in our film. She was married to Hal Jackson, whom everyone would, everyone would remember because he was such a force. He was also helping to um, book talent and find great artists to, to perform at the Apollo. And so she worked together with her husband. He also created uh, the Black Teen America the first sort of black teen pageants in America. And that was really important too. So you have these people who are, you know, kind of cultural pioneers leading these behind the scenes, um, epic historic moments. And to have a woman like that connecting with talent and bringing them onto the stage, that was really significant because there was a woman's movement happening, but black women were not included in that. You know, we're never included in this idea of we are feminists too, and we are pushing for our rights too. So Ellis always knew that women were in the forefront and that wasn't unusual to empower women. It just seems unusual when we look back now when you realize nobody else was doing it. <laughs> right. No, but so you, you said an interesting name, Hal Jackson. Now, is this the and, same Hal Jackson, WBLS Hal Jackson? Uh, he was at WBLS as well, yeah. I know Hal. That's Steve Harvey yeah. and I were, were WBLS from 2005 to 2007 when he was doing Sundays. Okay, that okay. guy was amazing. He was truly uh, 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 legendary. Uh, um, legendary, but I didn't know. I didn't know that until you brought it up. But again, uh, walking in history, talking in history, being a part of history. How I was in my life for two years when I was in New York with Steve Harvey on WBLS, and we was, Steve was doing the morning show, and how I would do Sundays, and we he'd always ask us to participate in community projects, and that's important. That you know, when I you know, I heard that name, I go, wow, this. This is pretty interesting that we are that connected in this relationship. But you brought in Blair Underwood into the project. Was it important yeah. to bring a name like that? How did he come into the relationship as far as a producer? He also did some voicing on the series because this is yeah. 10 years. So 10 years, you, st- you I had the idea. Can you just step us through, like, when did Stan get in, Stan Lathan get involved? When did Blair Underwood get involved? And when did you guys realize this project was going to be sold? Because it first was sold to a, a PBS format, correct? Right. Well, because the show originated on PBS, we thought it would be great to have a PBS premiere as kind of a homecoming. Mm-hmm. Because nobody has seen Soul for all these years. It's been in a vault, you know? And I just felt this show was made for the people by the people. It was free. You know, Ellis Hazlett put the public in public broadcasting. Right. He created a, a you know, it's it's not Downton Abbey and it's not Sesame Street, <laughs> but there is a black audience. There's a black nation. And he knew that. He always knew that. And so it was important for us to have a PBS premiere. And that happened during Black History Month. And that was really wonderful on Independent Lens. And they will continue to show the film for the next two years, every now and then. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted the film to reach a, 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 a national audience as well. And HBO max is an incredible platform for that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it happened as well when the nation was pivoting Mm -hmm. from the theater to digital and streaming, especially during COVID. Mm -hmm. And we just thought, well, what would Ellis Hazel do? He would be on the cutting edge of content delivery and trying to reach the people yes. just like he did back in the seventies. And in the seventies, he, we didn't have social media. Right. And so he called it the drum, you know, how in African communities, the drum was the message. The drum was how we got our 
message across how we learned how we were going to break away from freedom when we were enslaved. And, you know, there's a history of the drum. Right. And so Ellis would go out and he would call it the drum and he would canvas the black neighborhoods and say, did you see soul? Are you watching it? <laughs> Are you digging it? Is it giving you what you need? What do you want to hear? What do you like? What do you dislike? And so he was really a man of the people and a man of the streets. So we thought, well, we got to honor that with a PBS broadcast, mm -hmm. but let's also honor the way People want to see content now on their phones, on their tablets and streaming at their own, um, you know, their own time when they're right. ready. So right. HBO Max was really key for that. And they are doing so much dynamic programming right now. And right. they seem to be the most diverse of all the platforms. You know, that was important to us, too. Now, how did, how did Stan come on board and how did Blair Underwood right. come on board? So Stan came on board uh, originally as an interview right. and we had to have Stan because he's uh, one of the original directors and some of the best episodes, the, the Earth, Wind & Fire episode, the Al Green episode, mm -hmm. you know, the Stevie Wonder episode, mm -hmm. all of those were Stan Lathan. So we interviewed him and then later on after he saw the film, he said, you know, I really believe in this film, Melissa, I can't believe you. Got it done after 10 years. And I said, I would like to honor you and your connection and your, and your career with this being your first job, really, mm -hmm. to be uh, to be an executive producer. And so he said, yes, absolutely. So he came on to executive produce and help us get it to the next level. Blair Underwood, we knew we needed the voice of Ellis Hayslip. And we wanted a man who kind of straddled that old school sound, but also was totally connected with a contemporary audience. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and Blair has that, you know, mm -hmm. I've loved him since L.A. Law. I'm not going to lie. Right. So <laughs> I've been a big fan. But I also knew that he was a voice actor because he is on the um, a, sh uh, a show. Uh, it's an animated show, by the way. He does a lot of voiceovers, but he's also on the Lion King mm -hmm. Um, sequel called The Lion Guard mm -hmm. and I heard I just happened to catch some episodes of that and I thought wow he's really a great voice actor too mm -hmm. and we wanted somebody who would be the voice of Ellis Hazel but not a caricature not like a like trying too hard like what would Ellis sound like if he were thinking you right. know what right. Right. how do you get that that interior blackness like you don't hear that a lot you don't see it a lot in films you don't get to know what a black man is thinking mm -hmm. right and because he was an intellectual, I said, and because he's deceased, we're like, we have to give him a voice so it feels like he is with us and he's leading his own story and telling his own truth. That's and awesome. once, once Blair got involved and understood and after we, we actually I uh, showed him the film, he fell in love with it. Right. And he said, I want to be executive producer and do all that I can. Nothing to bring wrong with that. Home. Now we're talking to Melissa, the hey. writer director of the series, <laughs> Mr. Soul, because her uncle Ellis Haslip was the host of Soul, which was a right. PBS show that ran from 1968 to 19, 1973. Uh, among the guests the show showcase included, like she said earlier, Al Green, Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind & Fire, Patti LaBelle, Patti LaBelle. Gladys Knight, mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, Author James Baldwin in an intimate interview with po poet Nikki Giovanni, Cicely Tyson, Cool in the Gang, and Doing Magic, a young Arsenio <laughs> Hall. The, the, the show was um, a very enlightening for me, the documentary I enjoyed from start to finish. When you walked, you, you're seeing history, and you're seeing history uh, played out in New York. You're being, seeing history played out. And, and dramatic dr and drama because you don't know if the show is going to get renewed and why is and the underhand politics that get played into the whole process and that and then you get to bring on talented producers or EPs like Stan Lakin, like Blair Underwood and now it's being showcased on HBO Max what's the next step for your brand and what's the next step for your production company well we're also we're, uh, brought on the wonderful producer writer Emmy, Grammy, no, not Grammy yet, but an Emmy winner, Lena Waithe. Yes. And she's one of our producers as well. Mm -hmm. We also have Kaz Ebert and it's, and we have um, just amazing people. Stephanie Rance from the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And what we're working with Lena Waithe and her brand new record company called Hillman Grad Records to help mm -hmm. release the soundtrack of Mr. Soul. And that's going to come out via Def Jam and Universal Records. So we're just so excited because, you know, music in the film is, is a character, you know, it's not like a backdrop or an underscore, but black music is, and as Ellis Hayes have said, you know, the, the soul, the floor for black pride. Mm 
And we really, with Robert Glasper as our uh, amazing composer, and then he wrote a song for Layla Hathaway, mm-hmm. and that's a single that's going to be dropping very soon called Show Me Your Soul. And that was just a great song, and it was shortlisted for the Oscars this year for Best Original <laughs> Song. Well, the beauty of this is that your production company, Shoes in the Bed Productions, uh, like I said, you're a filmmaker, and that's your company, and that's the company that produces this particular project. Uh, as I close this interview, and uh, thank you for coming on my show. Thank you for the, giving me an early view of the Mr. Yeah. Soul uh, docuseries, which is wonderful. And in fact, when it comes on HBO Max, I'm going to recommend my friends to watch it, put it on social media. Please get those banners to me so we can put it out there. Any other projects in the works that we can look forward to seeing from your wonderful production company, Shoes in the Bed Productions? Well, Shoes in the Bed is just doing this, Mr. Soul, John. But I am also working on a new project with Netflix. I am producing, yeah, it's a series about women in hip hop. Uh, It's really the history of black womanhood in America, but it's explored through the lens of women in hip hop, their lives and their music. So, you know, it's the year of the black woman, so we got to represent. I'll just tell you that, Melissa. If you can turn that lens on Stan Lathan and slow him down, because that young man right there is walking history. Uh, people just don't understand. You know, he is truly a legend. I call yeah. him the godfather. Uh, when, he, when I came into Hollywood in 1994 to be in a position to just not even understand who he was, but he was just so humble and good looking and was, uh, was at the, uh, we was on ABC. He was the director of Steve Harvey's first sitcom, me and the boys. And over mm-hmm. the years, the deaf comedy jam, uh, the, the, the Kevin Hart project is on a- ABC, uh, uh, the house, uh, Hollywood, uh, Husband's yep. Hollywood, uh, uh, Hollywood Husband, or whatever the title of it is. Come, he, that's him behind that. And so many other projects now on this. Thank you for coming on Money Making Conversations and talking about oh, Mr. So Soul, HB, HBO Max. Uh, uh, uncle, he graduated from HBCU, Howard University. Thank you for you know? sharing this story. <laughs> you are wonderful. And again, I will be promoting this on my social media. I'll be promoting this in my newsletter. Just the words out, just like him. You miss soul right now, okay? You miss soul. You miss soul. He's miss soul. You miss soul. How you doing, miss soul? Miss soul. Thank you for coming on Money Making Conversations, okay, Melissa? Thank you so much, Rashad. Really, really, really. <laughs> if you want to see or uh, hear this interview on Money Making Conversations, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I'm Rashad McDonald. I am your host. <laughs>